what I pointed out last time is that if you if you look at the average C, it's one over k, right? And if you do let that t square, which is just the variance, it's one over k squared. So that's the average fluctuations are equal to one. Now Since the output is, is, is strictly proportional to the time it stays activated, and this is the meaning of that, then this will also be, sorry, there's a square here, right? Okay, so that's the, that's the puzzle. That you get 100% fluctuations when you have something that's exponentially distributed. And the, the way nat nature solves this is by having several steps to the activation. So instead of going straight like this, it will go something like this. So instead of having one step, you have k steps. So how does that help you with the reproducibility? So that's the, that's the experimental reproducibility you see in response to a single photon. This is the output current coming from the photoreceptors. And so we, what you can see is that this, you know, it's much less than 100% fluctuations. In fact, it's of the order of 25%. So why does that help you? Because imagine that for each of these, so maybe it's, this is a poor choice of notation, but Let's call that small n. So let's call that k1, k2, etc., until kn. So e each of these are rates. So the chemical reaction rate, so each of the times it will stay in each of the states will also be exponentially distributed. But the time from the most activated state to the completely inactivated state, let's call that T, it will be a sum of this Ti. Now you, you, you spend some time T in each of the states, some Ti in each of the states, and the total time you have to wait to go from the most activated state to the least activated state is the sum of the Ti's. So 
So you can calculate what you're interested in. We still use a model like this one, where the total activity generated by rhodopsin is simply proportional to the time it stays in any of the activated state. Right? As soon as it gets into R0, then it, it stops being active. So what I'd be interested in is calculating this kind of quantity, which is the, this is the, it's called the fractional variance or coefficient of variation. So in that case, it was 100%. How much is it in this case? So to this, I'll calculate the two moments. The first one is very easy. It's just the sum of the average times. Each of them is 1 over ki. Now, what about the second moment? So each of my ti's are independent of each other. So if you take the variance of a sum of independent variables, what you end up with is the sum of the variances of these variables, right? Is that OK for everyone? Probably you've seen this in other courses as well. Remember, I already know the result of this calculation. I did that last week. It's 1 over ki squared. Right? Each of these guys here is the result of some integral. Okay, but the reason why it's small is because I did it last week, so it's just to remind you. <laughs> you don't have to copy it. It's this just a calculation of the second moment of an exponentially distributed variable. Okay. I write it larger. Okay. Is this better? Now it's too low for some of you, but all right, so now I'm going to take. the ratio of these two quantities. And when I have is this. Can you think of a bound to this quantity? So here, in principle, if I were to design this system, maybe I can choose my ki's. Okay. So there's, 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 there's still some, <coughs> I I've still have some degrees of freedom in my ki's. But what is it going to be bound by? It would be a lower bound.
Anybody has an idea? Mathematicians in the audience? Come again? From zero to one? No. Well, it's larger than zero, yes. But it's also larger than another quantity, no matter what k you take. Come again? One over one over K. Well, it's one over There's no K here actually, right? It's KI. Besides, I mean remember this is a dimensionless quantity. One. Did I hear one? But if it, if, it, if it were one, I wouldn't gain very much compared to this, right? So remember I want a I want this to be as small as possible. I want to reduce I mean, okay, you can give a wild guess, but it doesn't have to be justified mathematically. But here we, we, we took n steps instead of one step, and to reduce the variance, right? It's, it's kind of always the same story. Like if you do something over and over, over again, you reduce the variance. So what is gonna be here? One over n, one over n right? Uh, that's the only quantity there is in this problem once I've told you that this was uh, dimensionless, right? So do you know why this is true? Do you know how to prove this? Again, uh, I'm asking uh, the mathematically trained people. Let me write, rewrite this for, for you for a second. That doesn't look any more familiar. Um, thank you. Yes. Oh. Uh, Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, maybe now, now we, maybe now the light bulb will just turn on. No, okay. So. This is a trick, and the trick is to use Cauchy-Schwarz. So Cauchy-Schwarz is, is a mathematical identity that tells you that if you have two vectors, x and y, The dot product is only smaller than the product of the norms. So what is my, what should be my x and my y to make this work? Well, I'm just saying that my x would be a vector with my k, one over k's. And my y would just be a vector of ones. And my x, my norm here is this. And my norm of y is just n.
So it's fairly simple. Here are my x. Here are my. And finally, OK, what is, so I want to make this as small as possible. So I would basically want to saturate this bound, which means I want to make this into an equality. Do you know in Cauchy-Schwartz, in what, under what condition the two things become equal? Come again? Right, but here you're thinking cosine, which is already defined from the scalar product, right? So this cos what does it mean that the cosine is 1? Okay, maybe we can rephrase this. Means they're, they're pointing in the same direction. Yeah, they're pointing in the same direction. So what I want is that I want x to be some proportional to y. And this is since this is 1, it just means that xi is constant, so in my case that means ki is constant. Okay, so all the steps should be the same. <coughs> all the steps should have the same residency time. And so if you do this, you you achieve this kind of precision. Okay. This was this. So it turns out that uh, one has identified on this rhodopsin molecule six sites, which, has, which are sites of chemical modifications. The, the exact mechanism is not exactly known, but it's believed that these sites may be involved in, in each of these, in, in the several steps of the deactivation. And so to, to test whether this, has a, this had any influence on reproducibility, these uh, researchers, this uh, science paper from 2006, what they did is that they, one by one, they introduced mutations in each of these sites where chemical modification can happen. And they tried uh, you know, to knock, knock off one. So a mutation would mean that the site would be made unfunctional, meaning that the chemical modification cannot happen anymore. So that's, it's called a knockoff in biology when you make something dysfunctional. So they try to remove one in one place or another, and then they try to remove you know, more, I mean, two, three, four, five, and even six. Okay. So they, they did these modifications, and then they, they, they did the same experiment as before, which was to try to see how reproducible the response is to a single photon. And so this is the wild type. So wild type is when there are no modifications. And you can see, as before, you get this nicely reproducible response. Uh, already, if you remove one of these sites, you disrupt a bit the response. It gets a bit more noisy. And if you remove more and more, you can see that it becomes more, and more stochastic. And you can see here also, in this case, this case really you get activation, and then boom, all of a sudden you get deactivation. Right? Here, activation, deactivation. And this really corresponds to the, to the first situation I was talking about, like you, the, the thing becomes active, so it, it signals, and then all of a sudden it becomes inactive, so you get really this stepwise decrease. Yes? The, it's just the, it's really, a, there's no difference from the conceptual point of view, it's just they, they knock off different sites. There are six sites that you can identify along the protein sequence. They're marked by the positions along the protein sequence here. So you, you can choose to, to make, introduce a, 
uh, a mutation in each of those. Yeah, so that is not, you know, it's still biology. I mean, it's not clear why uh, it should be exactly identical. Maybe these sites don't play exactly symmetric roles, right? We don't know. Maybe uh, the Ks are not exactly all equal to each other. Maybe there's an ordering in which this happens. We, do, we don't know for sure, right? Uh, but what, what we do know is that if you, so, so then what you can do is that you can calculate this, this the, the reproducibility of this response. What you do in practice is you, you calculate the CV, so a coefficient of variation, and the response as it is measured in uh, picoampers, right? So you, you, you measure the, this, uh, this response here, you calculate the coefficient of variation, and you do this for each of the chemical modification. And, and this is what you find. So they do this, the, the coefficient of variation for each of the mutants. So this is wild type. Sorry, this is the when they knocked off all of them. And this is the wild type. Okay. So the wild type sits here. As I said, you know, I said 25%, or well, it's a bit more like 30%. Yes. I meant that uh, uh, if, if it's not uh, related just to the number of them, they cannot take it as a parameter for the question. It, it's also dependent on the place of the Yes. Remote. Right. So, 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 so that means that you, you, you may get different points at different places here. Right. But I, I think that's okay for, for the kind of approximation this, that's made here. This is still a qualitative. I mean, it's still quantitative, but you know, one, if one wanted to do a more precise fitting of the effect of each of the sites, you would need to take m much, much more, more data. And you see that this data is still quite noisy, and it's still, the agreement is not perfect. So you know, this is like a first step, right? But you should just be aware that in, in, in uh, biological systems, it's, it's rare to get really good reproducibility, right? So it's not. So you're right, here different mutants could have different effects, right? So here they took the average. Well, in fact, here you see, I think there are two points, and they're very close to each other. So the thing is, is also like, remember, this doesn't work. Uh, remember, I mean, these traces themselves are stochastic, right? So here you say this one is more stochastic than this one. Well, it could just be a matter of realization. So here, they took the averages over the two mutants, and you see it falls pretty close to each other, actually. But the point is that you know here they, they you, you see that the more you remove sites, the more you increase the CV, and this is exactly the kind of intuition we have from here. It's like if you remove uh, you know, the more the more intermediate states you have, the more reproducible you are. This is what you see here. But it's even better than that. It is that this this CV they fit it with one over n, where n here is one plus uh, the modification site. Right, so the idea is that uh, the modification sites act as intermediate states, and then you have the the the, the first state as well. Okay, <coughs> and this is the this is not a fit really. This is really they f they just plotted one over n plus one, and it, I mean it's not perfect, right? But you can see that at least qualitatively it really goes the right way. OK, so there is a catch to this, though, which is, so here you, you can see that this is a, this is a strategy for really for reducing the, 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 the noise and reproducibility. And I just want you to, 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 uh, to, to really uh, be aware that uh, this will actually cost energy to the system. So why is that? Is because when I did this kind of chemical reaction, 
here I, I put single arrows, right, from activation to deactivation to activation. But in principle, in any, any chemical uh, reaction, they can also be the rever reversible reaction, right? And if I introduce these back arrows, then maybe this will introduce some noise as well. So, in, so here there's some noise because you need to wait for each step to go forward. But then, you know, if you can also go backward, you will add some noise, some additional noise. Okay. <clears throat> the reason why we, use, in many chemical reactions, we, we put a, you know, one big arrow and we basically prevent the other arrows from being there, we call it an ir irreversible reaction. And what this means, typically, is that the energy difference between the two is really too high to be able to go back to the previous state. So the, the way you can view it is that you have several states, like let's say six states. This is some reaction coordinate. It doesn't really matter. And you go down like this. And the point is that you know, the reason why you cannot go back up is because the, the energy difference between these steps is large enough, right? But you see that in order to be able to do this, you need to be able, you know, you lose energy each step of the way, right? This is dissipated. So you, you'd, you'd better make sure that you provide this energy to start with to then be able to go down this ladder of energy. Otherwise, you will not have a reversible, you will not have an irreversible react, a set of reactions. So here, what is the energy provided for, from? So it's rhodopsin. What happens to rhodopsin? Where, where, where could it get its fuel? What does rhodopsin do? Photon, right. So this is what the energy will come from. It will get excited, and then it will go down this ladder. But as I said, you know, there's, there's not, you know, this energy is still finite. It's still infinite. So the reactions will only be approximately irreversible. So. So here I put as a number of steps like CV equals 1 over n. But let's say that you know, I'm not limited by the number of steps by design. But I, I could lie on any sort of energy surface. And I get excited, I get here. And I, I, I'll, you know, the, the conformational state will roll its way down to the inactivated state. And this is some, here on the x-axis is some reaction coordinate. So I've, I'm going down from here down to here in energy scale. This is always energy scale. There will be some jitter due to thermal fluctuations. So it's the same kind of jitter that makes that I can go back and forth, right? Just thanks to thermal agitation. Can you guess what will be the upper bound on the CV? So CV is, again, it's the coefficient of variation in the time it takes to go from here to here. Right, so let me CV of T. Well, but th remember, this was, this was, again, an upper bound. And I was assuming here that it was perfectly irreversible. So here I'm putting myself in a, this was not realistic from a physical point of view, because the energy expenditure that was necessary to really get purely irreversible steps is infinite. Right? 
if you want purely inf uh, irreversible steps, you need an infinitely large energy barrier between one state and, uh, and the next one. So here I'm putting myself in a, in a, you know, it's a different bound. I can have as many steps as I want, but now there's an energy constraint. So I'm not going to do the calculation because it's, it's a bit, uh, it's not that complicated, but it's a bit hairy. But can you try and guess the, what the... If you have an one by n, but it also has a ratio of forward rate and the backward rate. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the idea of the calculation. <laughs> the ratio of forward rate and backward rate is by micro reversibility and detailed balance is equal to the exponential of the energy difference divided by kBT. Okay, but we're not going to do a calculation. Here, I just want an order of magnitude. And it's a simple, you know, you, you shouldn't try and look for something too complicated. Now, n is not a constraint anymore. You just have an energy, so this should, disp this should depend on energy. How should it depend on energy? Should it go down with energy or go up with energy? The, sorry, the energy, well, the energy that I provide, okay, so H nu. Okay, okay. So I have one energy and I need to make something that's dimensionless. What else do I have? Come again? No, because here I really have a continuous thing of step, you know, I have a continuous, uh, so what, what is the other energy scale that's relevant here? That makes that this will not be completely deterministic. It's temperature, right? It's the fact that, it's the very fact that you can go back and forth is because of temperature, right? If you have a zero temperature, you always go down in energy, you cannot go back up. All right, so the, the only other energy scale you have is KBT. Uh, and one can do a more complex calculation I mean it's not such a complex calculation, it's just a a mean first passage time or in, in a kind of calculation on some energy surface like this with thermal agitation. And this is the answer, right? So, so there's a two factor, but forget about this. It's not so important. You get KBT that will increase the CV, and you have the energy you provide, which is H nu, that will decrease the CV, okay? So it's a competition between the, how much energy you provide and how much thermal agitation there is. So now that's interesting because we know these numbers for the rhodopsin, right? So we, that can give us a bound on, on how well rhodopsin could do, even if it were perfectly uh, designed by evolution. You know, the fact that the, the photon can only provide so much energy will make, will make a bound on this CV and then ultimately on the ability to detect signal photons, right? So KBT is what? KBT at, at room temperature uh, I, I put everything in electron volts that's KBT at room temperature and then uh, H nu so I'll take the typical nu of uh, you know, visible light, light that, seen, that can be seen by cones. It's about 500 nanometers. So in that case, H nu, let me put these numbers, 2.5 electron volts. So 50 is the answer, roughly. So if you convert that into number of steps, it's like it's as if you, you cannot have more than 50. Sorry, let me.
it's as if you have 50 different steps at most. Right? So there are six, which is less. But you can see that it doesn't, you know, in orders of magnitude, it's not that different, right? It's just maybe one order of magnitude different. Come again. Please speak louder. It should be equal to one over forty. Ah, one over forty. Sorry. To the, you mean to get this? Why did I get this wrong? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Thank you. <coughs> One shouldn't trust one's notes. So, all right. So, so. So far, we've been focusing just on the photoreceptors and the response to signal photons. Yes? So if the signal continues further, it's more realistic or not? It's not a question of realistic here. It's, it's a question of a bound. So what, what I was interested in here is what's the, you know, again, like in many of these things, I want to know what's the maximally achievable performance as defined by the physical constraints. And here the physical constraint is and uh, you know, in this calculation, I want to say, okay, there's so much energy budget I have, and with a given energy budget, I can make, I can achieve a certain precision, right? And uh, this is what this calculation, which I didn't do, is about. Okay. So it's not about being realistic or not. It's that you cannot beat that, no matter how you do it, no matter how realistic you do it. If you do something realistic, like what happens in the actual system, you're going to be way above one over fifty. But even if you optimize and fine tune everything, you couldn't beat that bound, right? So that, that's the important lesson: is that the, you know the physics really constrains the design. Like this is really here, the energy is really constrained on how well you can do. And then the question, the second, the next question is: how does biology, you know, how close does biology get to that, right? And here, you know, I, I would argue that it gets pretty close. I mean, it doesn't get to one over fifty, but it gets to to you know. You know, if you had to put 50 steps, for instance, it would be really, really complicated. Maybe two big proteins and stuff. So it, it's it's not doing so bad, right? At least uh, the order of magnitude is roughly the right one. <coughs> okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about later processing. Skip that. So, in, in particular, you already, uh, Alexandra introduced uh, information theory to you, and so here we're going to make use of it to understand what happens in later processing. And so, you have the photoreceptors. And then, fly visual system, this will. These will talk to so-called monopolar cells. And so we, <coughs> we, we'd be interested in just this step for now. And after the break, uh, I'll, I'll talk about something completely different, which it would be a maximum entropy modeling. All right. So Let's call X the signal that comes out of the photoreceptors. And Y 
what goes into the monopolar cells, what comes out of the monopolar cells, right? So you have to think of this as an information transmission device, right? So you have a noisy signal, you have a signal that comes in into these monopolar cells, and then you have the signal that comes out, right? So it's the same kind of setting as Alexander was talking about, and what we're interested in is to see whether the information transmission from X to Y, whether it's, it's at not maybe optimal, but whether it's well designed. Yes? You don't have to, I mean, it doesn't really matter for this purpose. This is like the first, like, you know, the, the retina works by layers. So this is in the fly retina. In your retina, you have photoreceptors, then you have bipolar cells, and then you have later stages of processing. Here I'm interested in the first stage of processing, okay? So in the fly, the first stage of processing would be performed by monopolar cells. So what they do is that they take input for the photoreceptors, and they basically process this information. Okay, and then out comes Y. So I, I want I want to study this as as a as a as a channel, right? In the information in the sense of information theory, I have some X and I come out you know input that would be an input, and this would be an output. So what Alexandra already did is she she looked at the case where. Y was linearly, re linearly related to X plus some noise. Okay. So here, I'll do something a bit different. I'll now also assume that uh, G can be a nonlinear function. So G and, and the, the magnitude of the noise here will characterize the properties of my channel. And ultimately, the, que the question I would like to, to answer is to see whether this g of x it has, a, it has a particular form, and I want to justify this, its form in terms of uh, efficiency of information transmission. Okay? But for, for this, I need to first calculate what information transmission is in this, in this, in this simple system. So. This is the mutual information. And remember, this guy is the entropy. Uh, so. So it's the reduction of entropy from, if I just consider y, the output, minus the entropy of considering y, knowing the input. Okay, so it's symmetric. I can do, uh, I can do both. For, for this calculation, this formulation would be uh, more convenient. So I just need to calculate these two guys. I'll make a, a drawing. So this is G of X. This is the average response. And then if I did, if I did an experiment where I fixed X and I measured Y, and I put a dot every time I record Y, I would get something like this. Okay. The difference between this and that is just epsilon. 
So this is the uncertainty. Is the, is the entropy corresponding to the uncertainty of y if I fix x? Okay, so if I fix x, I look at the, the set of y's I can get. It's Gaussian, right? So if I say that the variance of my noise is sigma squared, I just have this. If I'm interested in the entropy, of this is the entropy of a Gaussian variable. And Alexandra told you how much that was. <coughs> and it's, or you can redo the calculation. That's the answer. Okay, so now the second part is to know is to know S of Y, which is the entropy of the probability distribution of the output. So you see here the thing is this will depend on the probability distribution of the input, right? So I have a certain distribution of X and uh, maybe see okay. So here I'll put a P of X, non necessary ga Gaussian. I mean, I put it like a bell shape, but. And here I represent it P of Y given X in green. But then if I just want to know. of y, I need to draw my axis at random, then add some random noise, and then you know do a histogram of the result. Okay, and this will be a uh, something wider. So it, in fact, it, it's it's quite it's not that easy to calculate. If I want to know p of y, what I need to do is that. I need first to draw x. So I put, just to be clear, I just uh, put a label here for x and y. So first I draw x. And then I draw y. Right? And then I sum of all the x's that could have given that y. And that I know. So that's the input distribution. So the noise here is just a Gaussian. You see, at the end of the day, I want to take the entropy of this, which itself depends on the input distribution, right? 
So the mutual information, and that's an important feature, is that the mutual information always depends on the input distribution. Here, what is the input distribution? It is essentially the statistics of the input currents. And ultimately, the statistics of the input currents in this is the statistics of the natural world. So it's the statistics of the, of the levels of luminosities that the fly will see in the natural environment. So in a way, this is, that, that is fixed, right? You can view this as, as fixed. So let me just finish this calculation. What we'll do, here we can't really go any further. We do a small noise approximation, which means that sigma Um, yeah, this sigma is small. Let me, it's too complicated to, right? So I, I assume in, in this one that sigma is very small. I mean that the noise is very small. And what this will lead me to is to, can simply approximate this with the Dirac delta function. I do change of variable, what I call y prime equals g of x, OK? So why do I want to do this? It's because dy prime equals dx g prime of x, just my change of variable. And so here I replace this by an integral over y prime. And I put x of g minus 1 y. So it's g minus 1 is the inverse function of g. And then I replace my delta function here. Uh, sorry, I have a so I also have x equals g minus one of y. So I'm here I'm just dividing by, by this. Uh, and uh, okay. Come again. Yes. Y prime. And here, y prime. There's y prime everywhere. So, but the point is that, of course, there's a delta function. So all of this gives me that py of y is just one of the g prime You see, there's a 
the one-to-one -one mapping between px of x and py of y. This is just a change of variable. So through change of variable, so it's like the deterministic version. So I have an input distribution px of x. I can turn it into an output distribution in a small dose approximation where y is just given by this. Right? Because if you do the, if you do this, you, you know, get that, and you know, this is equivalent. <coughs> Or it's equivalent you know, in, in quotes. <coughs> so I'll keep this. So to summarize, this is my mutual information. Where here, this thing here is given from the input distribution by this relationship. So what is, Alexandra already told you about this, but the channel capacity, C, is when you maximize this dimensional information over the input distribution. So that's from an engineering point of view. Typically, you have a channel. So channel here is just, um, you know, it, it can be any sort of channel, but in, in, in electrical communications, it can be a, you know, a cable or something like that. And you have relationship between the input and the output, and that's given by the physical constraint of your, of your cable. And then if you're an engineer, you want to maximize information transmission. So what you want to do is that you want to tune the input distribution so that you maximize the mutual information between the input and the output, in other words, so that you maximize information transmission. And when you do that, you reach the channel capacity. Right? That's the maximum of that transmission. And here we can ask the same question for this, for this um, processing device. And as I said, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between these two quantities. So instead of doing the, of taking the, the maximum respect to px of x, I'll take the maximum respect to the output distribution, because in my small noise approximation, it's the same. Right? So what I'll do simply is that I take the functional derivative of my mutual information with respect to py of y. And you can see the functional derivative here will be fairly simple, because it will be minus 1 minus log of PYY. Uh, OK, sorry, I should add something to this. 
here I need to add the Lagrange multipliers, multiplier to make sure my distribution sums up to one. Okay? If you want. So what is this? It's minus one minus log py of y minus lambda equals zero. And this means p of y of y is a constant. Doesn't depend on y. So the, the, the best way to maximize information transmission is essentially making sure that all your outputs here are equally likely. So instead of having this sort of distribution I showed here, you would have something like that. Uniform distribution of outputs. So <clears throat> this is interesting because it's something one can test actually in the biological system. So I can translate that back into, so saying that the output distribution is constant. Tells me something about the input distribution. So this is constant. Let's call it, let me call it alpha. What this means is that if I look at the input distribution, it should be equal to the derivative of the transmission function. <coughs> In other words, if I take the cumulative distribution, which is defined as this, this should be proportional to the function g, right? So the function g is this thing here. So that's nice because it's a testable prediction. So uh, people looked at this. So there's a Simon Laughlin in the 80s. What he did is that he, he went out into the natural world to measure the distribution of inputs that uh, may impinge the retina of the fly. And so he found a distribution. So he measured, essentially, he measured this, right? He measured the, input, the distribution of light intensities. And then he measured the g of x, OK? So for that, you can you take your, your retina, you do uh, some electrophysiology, and you measure the input, the out output current, the mean output current as a function of the, of the input current. So you measure this g of x. And then you can plot one against the other. And this is what he found. Here, the solid line is the community distribution I just put here, right? And these, these are the results of the physiological experiments, where he measures the voltage of the monopolar cells as a function of the input. <coughs> and so he, he, you can see that it actually follows it very nicely. Right? So what does it mean? You know, another way of interpreting this is, you know, you have this g of x. Or rather, you have an input distribution. So your light intensity is typically here, right? So light intensity is x is proportional to the light intensity in that case, because it's the output of the photoreceptors. So you have your light intensity here. If you want to have your transfer function, what you want you want to place basically the dynamic range of your transfer function. Transfer functions typically look like this. They have some you know, sigmoidal kind of shape. And really where the most sensitive one is in the middle. 
right? Because if you're sitting here, you cannot distinguish between this input and that, that, that input, right? They all give the same output. So what you really want is when you put the soft spots, that's the place where really you have a lot of sensitivity, and sensitivity here is really measured by G prime. This is how much you're sensitive to changes in the input. You want to you want to put it the, the place where G prime is maximum, so the inflection point of that curve. You want to put it in the middle of your distribution of inputs, right? <coughs> so this is the design principle that will maximize information transmission, and this is what's observed here. But there, there's a there's a stronger um, there are stronger predictions from from this kind of theory, and this all goes into the general theme of uh, efficient coding, is that uh, the visual system in in general will always try to do something like this. So the thing is that sometimes, you know, you can experience this if you go into a dark room. In the beginning, you won't see anything. And then after some time, you adapt, right? So you can think of it this way. Like, when, when you were in a, you were in a, in a, you know, in the sun, let's say, your input distribution, so this is your x, this is the light intensity you experience. Your, your input distribution is, is around here, right? So what happens is that you, you set your, your retina adapted to set its response function here, OK? But now you suddenly go into a dark room. So all of a sudden, the distribution of your intensities go here. In the beginning, you don't see anything because your response function is just this one. So it's really, it's not doing anything. It's not firing, right? You're not seeing it. And what happens in, during adaptation is that the retina will change its physiological parameters so that this response curve will now move here. And now you start seeing better, right? But it's even better than that. So you can actually show this in the retina that you get this adaptation at the level even of photoreceptors. But it gets better than that. It's like it also works if you change the contrast. So this, uh, this is adaptation to the mean light level. <laughs> but now you can also imagine that sometimes you look at, let's say, you're looking at a just a white wall behind you, right? So if you, if you think about it, the distribution of intensities will be very peaked because all you see is white, OK? So in that case, you adapt, your immune system will adapt, sorry, your visual system will adapt to have a fairly sharp response function like this, right? By virtue of this. But now you go back, you go into the woods, for instance, in a certain sunny day, then you get huge contrast because you get some places that are lit by the, su by the sun, some others are in the shade. And then you get a very wide distribution. And then you, your visual system will also adapt not just the mean level, but will also adapt its response function to be much more shallow like this. Right? <clears throat> and what's amazing is that this also is a prediction for how the, re the retina should respond. And this, is, this was done, for instance, this are experiments in uh, in, the, in, in, the, in ganglion cells, in vertebrate ganglion cells. So these are later stages of processing still in the retina. But what they did here is that they, they changed the contrast of what they were showing. Right? So they, they were showing some stimulus, and all of a sudden they changed the contrast. So the contrast is like the width of distribution of this distribution. And when you see that when you change the contrast, the mean is the same. You see you know, a big change in the activity, and then it goes back to some level. Then you, you change the contrast again, and it goes back to the same level. And you can also see this in, in uh, later stages of processing in the fly. And this is this idea, is that here they did adaptation to also different contrast of, uh, of in that case, of speed, because these are cells that are sensitive to speed. And <clears throat> if you look at the response functions, you get these different green uh, functions I showed here. But now the, the prediction here is that if instead of showing this response function, so the g of x, 
as a function of x. So the g of x here is the, the green one. And the, the blue, the white one is p of x. So instead of showing g of x as a function of x, you show it as a function of its variance, where the variance squared. So you renormalize by the width of the input distribution. Then the prediction of this is that all these curves should fall on top of each other. Right? And this is what they, they managed to show here. Like you see different response functions to different uh, contrast. And here you can see that they all fall on top of each other. All right, so uh, we'll take a break now, a short one, five minutes. And uh, we're back at 25, and then I'll start on maximum entropy. Okay. Let's start now because there, there isn't much time left. So first, a bit of motivation for, uh, for the, the last part of the course. So the goal is to, to learn some, uh, something from highly correlated data. So what I'm going to talk to you about is general set of techniques. Can I have your attention, please? So we, we, we're going to try and learn uh, the collective behavior of complex biological data. And let, just, let me just give you a few uh, elements of motivation. So <clears throat> the idea is to really try and understand how many units come together and interact to give emergent behavior. So this is something you see in physics, of course, like in magnets and stuff like that. But also in biology, you see it in a, at, at a you know, wide variety of scales. So even at the molecular scale, like maybe some of you guys are familiar with the protein folding problem. So you can view this as a, as a collective emergent behavior, like with coming, coming from the interactions between the different amino acids. There's another example, which is allosteric binding, which I think maybe Alexandra told you about when talking about the health functions. Uh, but then, you know, if you go up the ladder of scales, you see that even at the cellular scale, like uh, the way different cells interact with each other to form an organism uh, is also a collective behavior. So one example of this, of course, is the brain, where you get many neurons that interact with each other, uh, leading to emergent behavior. But even at, the, at an even larger scale, at the population scale, how different individuals interact with each other to give rise to collective behavior that you couldn't have predicted by just you know, observing the, the individuals one by one. And you can see this, for instance, in, this is a termite mound. Or uh, an example I'll be talking about is, is cooling of fish or collective movements of, uh, of animals. Let me skip that. And you know, remember I told you about the, the Bayesian way of thinking about this? And the approach I'm going to take is, is a bit different than the usual approach, as I said, where you start from the model, you, ex you, you calculate what you should get for the observables. Here I'm going to start from the observables and try and, and uh, back out and, and infer back the model. So the, the general technique for doing this is maximum entropy modeling. And the idea is, is quite simple. Let's imagine that you have so you have, you have n agents. 
So you have, you have to think of your agents. They could be anything. They could be amino acid on a protein chain. They could be cells. They could be genes in a gene regulation network. Uh, they could be neurons. Or they could even be individuals in the group. Okay. Each agent is characterized by a variable xi. Okay. So again, xi could be anything, but you know, we can think of it as a, as a number for the moment. So this, the state of the system, the collective state of the system is given by the vector of all the states taken together. And in, in the kind of modeling I'll be doing, one, one always assumes that the model is characterized by a probability distribution over all possible states. Right? So I assume my model is stochastic. And so what would give me the relationship between these different variables is not a deterministic one, but it's going to be, going to be given by some probability distribution. And I want to know how to build this probability distribution directly from the data. So the, the, the naive way of doing this, if, you, if I'm not, not so naive, it would be to you observe your, your system many, 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 many times. And you, for each of the times you observe, you record all your axes of all your data points. And then you draw a huge histogram of that in this very highly dimensional space. The problem with this is, is, is what I just said, it's very highly dimensional. So you run into what's called the curse of dimensionality, which is that you cannot simply count the multiplicity of states there. Right? So you need to make simplif simplifying assumptions. So maximum entropy is a principle by which you will really f focus on a few observables of your system, and you want a probability distribution that really reproduces the, these observables, but that is otherwise as random as possible, right? So <coughs> let's say you have k observables that you call OA, and that can depend on the entire state of the system. So when I say observables, you have to think of something simple, like OA of x, for instance, it could be simply the first you know, xi, right? So that would be a, a monomial, but you could, you could also imagine that it could be simply the product of, of two variables if x is real. Come again? What's the, what is the function? What's the, it's a function of x vector. The, state. the entire state of the system. So here, it's, it's, this are, these are examples. I'm going to derive a general proof. For example, it could just, you know, one of the observables could be just the state, the numerical state i. It could be the second one. You'll see in a second how, how that comes about. But what you want is you want two requirements. You want the average of these observables within the model to be equal to the empirical value. So let's say I have I have m empirical samples. So these are my measurements. I measure the state of the system of the entire system m times. So this would be my samples. And what I call uh, the empirical value of this, or average over the data, is just something like this. Not 
this is this is a this is a big O, not a theta. Right, so I want this is my first requirement. My second requirement is that it's otherwise as random as possible. So what's the good measure for saying that something is as random as possible? And the answer is already on the board. Entropy. So I want to maximize the entropy. So I'll define a functional phi, which is, would just be my entropy. And I'll add Lagrange multipliers. To enforce this condition. And I'll add yet another one. To enforce normalization. OK? And so I'm looking for probability distribution. So I'm going to take a functional derivative of this with respect to the entire P of x. When the first term get minus 1 minus log of p of x. Then if I break this down, what is this? It's just a sum of all x's of p of x's. All right, so if I take the derivative of this with respect to p, I just end up with this. And as usual, I have my mu here. So here I use the technique of Lagrange multipliers, of course. And these are my Lagrange multipliers. Sorry, here there's a sum of a. I can rewrite this in the following manner. So this is the result. The result is that then if I do this, max, this entropy 
maximization subject to this constraint on the observables, I end up with this form, which is kind of right in this familiar form, which is the Boltzmann law. So exponential minus uh, Hamiltonian. When the Hamiltonian, I would just have this uh, linear sum of my observables with these Lagrange multipliers. Okay. So in fact, when I've done this, I haven't solved the problem yet. Because as always, when I use Lagrange multipliers, then I need to adjust the Lagrange multipliers so that I can satisfy the constraints. Right. So I will have here, I've, these are the parameters of my model, if you like. And then I need to tune the lambdas so that I enforce this. And that's not necessarily very easy. So let, let's look at a simple example. Let's just say that xi is a binary variable. Actually, let's assume that xi is a, is a classical spin, meaning it can take values plus 1 or minus 1. So it's, it's the same as saying it's a binary variable. It's just uh, the values are minus 1 and 1 instead of being 0 and 1. And now let's assume that my observables would just be the xi, OK? So for i going from 1 to n. What this means is that I want my distribution to have the same mean value of xi as in the data, OK? So it's a constraint on the mean value of xi. So if I use this formula, this will give me that p of x is 1 over z exponential minus some, so let's call my Lagrange multipliers the same as before. Sorry, this, this is the sum of a k. Got this wrong. This is some of a k. Okay. So here I, I just redefined for lambda i equals minus h i. You see why in seconds. So in fact, here, what you recognize once you've written things this way is that this is just a system where you have independent spins that each are subject, subjected to their own external field, right? The site-dependent external field, HI. So they're independent because I can factorize this distribution. And in fact, I can calculate Z. Z is, is is the normalization constant. It's my partition function in the language of uh, statistical mechanics. It will be the sum of all x's of this product. And here, because it's a sum of independent terms, I can factorize this. To summarize, z 
as a product. Okay. So now remember what I want to do is I want to calculate the H's. These are my Lagrange multipliers, right? By virtue of this definition. I want to tune my H's so that I do actually get the right value for these guys. Okay? So these guys, they spin so I can call them local magnetizations. I call them MI, right, by definition. And sorry, this would be the data one. <coughs> so how do I do this? Well, all I have to do is to calculate within my model xi and xi is 1 over z product of a j so uh, sum over x xi product of j and here you just have essentially have two different situations either it's a j is equal to i or it's not so it would just be one over z exponential hi minus exponential minus hi products sorry about that there you go probably remember my, my z was itself this product so it would cancel out all the terms except for one and the final answer is to hyperbolic sinus <coughs> right so my constraint now what it gives me it tells me how to calculate hi from what i measure so this is what i really measure simply the inverse hyperbolic tangent of my measurement, okay? So this is simple, you know, spin physics because they're independent. But the point is that here you really need the inverse of the usual relationship because that's what you measure and you want to know what the H's are, right, to build your model. Because HI in physics is usually what how you call a field. This would be so it's to 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 have a an analogy with physics. It's just a yeah, it's just a notation. This so you can view this as a notation. This is Boltzmann law, and go, again, you know, I have to set KBT to zero, to one, in order to make this work. But okay, so, so that's the simple case of independent spins. I just wanted to show you when it gets interesting. So I, I said, you know, the, the motivation for doing this is to describe emergent behavior and correlated data 
There's a question here? No? And here I gave you an example of independent variables. Okay. So if I want to know something about the correlated behavior, what I can do is that I can also add this kind of observable. So these will be the correlation functions, the pairwise correlation functions between two variables. And in that case, the P of X I end up with looks like this, OK? So these are my lambda i, right? So my lambda a, I just call the, 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 the coefficients my Lagrange multipliers differently, whether they apply to the first order terms or the second order terms. So here I, I take my my set of observables is given by the entire set of, uh, of uh, first order and second order terms. And the model I end up with looks like an Isaac model, but it's a disordered Isaac model because the JIJs can take any value. The, H, the Hs, the fields, can also take any value. But again, you know, the inverse problem is you measure the M MI and the CIJ, for instance, let's call that the connected correlation function. Connected. So that's what you measure. And from that, you want to calculate HI and JIJ. OK? So that's what the inverse problem is, because usually, in, in, let's say in spin graph physics, you, you're given some information about how the fields and couplings are distributed, for instance, or what their values are. And then you calculate these observables, right? Here, you, do, you have to do the opposite. But it's, it's also more, you know, it's, it's a kind of a different task, because here, you're going to get a very heter heterogeneous system in principle, right? You, you have biological data. You can get any values for these pairwise correlations and these uh, magnetizations. So I think I've, I've, I should stop here. But tomorrow, we'll apply this uh, specifically to the case of correlated neurons to see how we can model uh, how many neurons act together. And, uh, and if I have time, I also show an application to, to collective behavior and bud flocking. <laughs>